Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'll be speaking on an approach to orthopedic oncology. I will not be trying to focus on every diagnosis within the field, but just a general approach to the specialty uh, when you see a bone lesion, as well as presenting some cases to uh, illustrate what I'm showing. So the first question that must be answered is always whether a lesion is benign or malignant. Uh, this takes you down very different paths over the course of treatment, as well as you know what other specialists you need to get going to get involved um, with the care of the patient. Uh, so this lesion on um, the pelvis on the left here uh, has a well-defined uh, border uh, with a sharp zone of transition. Uh, there doesn't appear to be much matrix uh, within the lesion. Um, and all these things lend themselves to a benign lesion, but um, until you have a tissue diagnosis, uh, it's hard to know for sure. Uh, there's also something uh, uh, more distally in the femur, which could um, you know, raise a question of whether this is some sort of skip lesion. So um, certainly still a question to be answered. And then um, on the right here in the tibia and the proximal aspect, you can see that there is a more permeative lesion uh, that has uh, what appears to be an osseous matrix um, with uh, wide zones of transition. Um, and this is more concerning uh, for a malignant lesion um, and, you know, also uh, is going to uh, need further investigation. Uh, so the, the, one of the first things you're going to do um, surgically uh, is perform a biopsy. And this is the most uh, common procedure within orthopedic oncology and it really requires a thoughtful approach uh, to be done correctly uh, because it's not just the surgeon who is involved, but also uh, you want to have a team that includes a radiologist so um, they can help you with what other uh, imaging uh, might be helpful or if there's a certain area within a lesion um, that they think would be um, optimal to biopsy, um, as well as a pathologist who uh, you may need on standby if you're planning to do a frozen section at the time of surgery, or certainly one who is uh, trained with uh, bone-specific um, diagnoses, um, since you know they can be very complex to make, even um, with all the appropriate um, pathologic staining that is um, accomplished after the biopsy. So before you go into the OR, you want um, adequate preoperative imaging. Usually this includes an MRI um, of these lesions, but um, for some it's more appropriate to get a CT scan. Um, it's also helpful to have a bone scan um, on any bone lesion or lesion that you think is um, malignant. Uh, so you can see uh, what type of spread um, you might be dealing with. And if there potentially is a lesion that might be even easier to um, access uh, with a biopsy, uh, that you might not even be aware of. Um, and then one of the main concepts is if you're just trying to obtain tissue, the, you want to minimize the morbidity of the procedure, but really maximize the diagnosis. And uh, you don't want to have to biopsy something twice uh, if you don't have to. And so this is done usually one of three ways. Um, a core needle is done usually under a CT guidance. Um, or if it's a soft tissue sarcoma, it can actually be done uh, in the office. Um, an incisional biopsy is done for most uh, bone malignancies because uh, you want to uh, be able to maintain uh, the structure of the uh, lesion, and that's often done uh, with pituitary, which you're seeing here on the right, uh, which is able to grasp um, entire sections of tissue. Um, a jam sheety needle can also be used, uh, which obtains a larger core of tissue. Um, and then the excisional biopsy is one that is really only done um, for uh, tumors that are in the soft tissues that are superficial and that you feel like you can get a um, wide margin on um, with minimal morbidity. Um, because even if something's small, uh, it could still be a sarcoma and you, you don't want to get too cute taking it out and then have the pathologist tell you a week later that that was a sarcoma and then you have to wonder oh, did I get it all at the time of excision, even if it was a small mass. Um, you always want to plan your biopsy um, with a thought of what the definitive resection is going to look like. Uh, for the example on the right, if this were to be some sort of uh, malignant lesion that you would um, often approach uh, this from the lateral side, um, potentially with um, a uh, so either an arthroplasty or a, a joint sparing approach, but either way, you'd probably approach that laterally, which is why the pituitary is coming in um, from the lateral aspect. 
Um, and then you want to have meti meticulous technique, including hemostasis, as well as closing all your tissue planes uh, so that you limit the spread of whatever tissue uh, was obtained at the time of diagnosis. Uh, you don't want to increase the um, surgical field um, or spread of anything that's malignant. So uh, benign lesions are often treated at the same uh, time as the biopsy if they're determined on frozen section to be 100% benign. And that's why you're seeing on the right that this same lesion that was biopsied was then um, treated at that same time. Uh, you can do this either intralesionally, which is shown here, um, or a marginal uh, resection, meaning that you're going through the reactive zone of the tumor, um, but not trying to get a wide margin of normal tissue. Uh, you want to be aggressive with your uh, curatage and then extend that curatage with the burring, which is shown in the uh, image and then do some sort of adjuvant treatment to extend um, this further, uh, most commonly done uh, with ORs that have availability um, of the, with the argon beam coagulator, uh, but other institutions will use liquid nitrogen or phenol um, to increase the area um, that they can achieve um, cellular death, which is really what you're going for to get all that little microscopic disease within this lesion. Um, and then to help the lesion heal faster, you usually perform some sort of bone grafting to fill that void. Um, like I said, to, to get the patient healing and functional uh, more quickly. So the treatment for benign lesions is not always benign, uh, depending on where the lesion is. Here, this is an 18 year old uh, male who presented to an ER after playing uh, basketball. He had a, he was jumped up and then came down on his leg and had extreme pain. Uh, this was his scout image on his CT since he went straight to the CT scanner. And he was treated um, initially at the institution where he was brought to. And this is a uh, strong warning sign um, or that I would give to anyone uh, treating these lesions that are this extensive that um, often transferring to the definitive care or care center or tertiary center where they're going to be receiving their definitive treatment is preferable um, than doing um, a procedure like this where you think you're helping this person by stabilizing, um, you know, the limb uh, for the transfer, but um, it can actually um, lead to uh, worse treatment for the patient because a number of mistakes were made um, with this. You can see that there was a fan and steel incision uh, made across the abdomen in order to obtain the biopsy, which contaminates the entire um, area of the pelvis with potential leakage of this tumor. Um, these pins are placed, and you now have multiple X-fix um, pins uh, incisions that are gonna need to be um, considered if you're planning to do a large resection or a hemipelvectomy, uh, which may not have otherwise been within your incision. You, all know, you also now have these pin tracks um, in the proximal femur, which may interfere with any sort of implant you want to use. So um, really what would have been better here is to stabilize the patient with some sort of distal femoral traction. Um, and then obtaining the CT scan was fine, but then knowing that you have this CT scan um, shown here, which is showing a lesion which looks very pathologic um, with, um, you know, radiolucencies throughout the acetabulum, uh, that this is better um, transferred right away uh, to a tertiary care center if you're not comfortable performing the definitive resection um, so you can prevent some of those mistakes. Because luckily, while this lesion ended up being benign, if it had been malignant, uh, this patient would have had a high risk of local recurrence given um, the way the biopsy was performed. So um, the biopsy showed uh, giant cells, which you can see here uh, surrounding pools of blood. And this uh, could easily be diagnosed as an aneurysmal bone cyst um, if you know, your pathologist um, isn't familiar with bone lesions. However, um, on further staining, uh, this was determined to be a chondroblastoma with uh, secondary aneurysmal bone cyst changes. Um, and I think this highlights that having an experienced pathologist is really important uh, to getting the correct diagnosis. And while those are both benign lesions and are treated similarly, um, other ones, you know, you may be dealing with a benign versus malignant diagnosis. So uh, the treatment for this patient was a complex uh, total hip arthroplasty uh, that included using his natal, native femoral head um, as a graft to help uh, reconstruct his acetabulum as well as this posterior plate, um, which was used to 
uh, reconstruct his posterior column to stabilize the pelvis. And then as I said, you can see that this uh, implant um, is going directly uh, across those X-fix uh, pin sites without uh, much of a holiday. So um, he did not end up getting infected post-op, but certainly is a concern um, that would have been best avoided. Um, so now uh, transitioning to malignant lesions and how they need to be considered, um, especially from the outset, um, appropriate staging must be done in all cases. Uh, this is very important because you need to know exactly what kind of disease you're dealing with and how far it's spread because that's going to impact basically all your treatment decisions from there on out. For a bone sarcoma um, or a soft tissue sarcoma, you want to get a chest CT and um, a, a representative chest CT is shown here, which is what you're looking for, which is um, all these small nodules um, within uh, the lung parenchyma, which are indicative of um, metastasis. And the chest is the most common site uh, for both bone and soft tissue sarcoma. So that's why a chest CT is done. Um, if it's a bone lesion, you want to get a bone scan and an MRI of the entire bone. Um, some diagnoses like Ewing's also require a bone marrow biopsy. Um, as, and sometimes a PET scan is um, indicated if you're looking for recurrence or also can evaluate the um, overall spread of disease. Um, so for soft tissue sarcoma, um, it's mostly just a chest CT and an MRI, um, but other certain lesions um, or certain forms of sarcoma, you do require getting a chest, abdomen, and pelvis um, or a spine MRI, uh, given that uh, they're more likely to spread to those areas although uh, these can um, often be done after a biopsy. Um, for the common malignant bone tumor, tumors, you have osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma, um, most frequently seen in childhood um, as well as adolescence. Um, and chemotherapy is extremely important treating these um, uh, children. So having a pediatric oncologist on your team is essential um, and radiation is used less commonly. Uh, and then the more adult diagnosis of sarcoma in the bone is chondrosarcoma, which um, an example is shown here um, on the right, um, more of a surgical disease because uh, chemotherapy and radiation are less effective against chondroid tumors. Uh, and there's a wide spectrum of aggressiveness of chondrosarcoma. But again, just looking at the tumor itself, um, you have a permeative lesion with some moth-eaten areas in the proximal humerus. Um, as well as a more uh, chondroid matrix versus the osseous one I showed in the past, because this one has more rings and arcs, they're called, um, versus that more fluffy, um, diffuse osseous matrix. Um, you also don't have a good, uh, a good sense on the radiograph uh, how far this extends um, into the humerus, so that's where the MRI um, becomes very helpful. Um, another example of osteosarcoma, this is the same one I showed before with more advanced imaging. Um, you can see that there's a soft tissue mass on axial imaging, as well as um, some bone marrow edema in the tibia. And then on her bone scan, you can see this is a three-phase bone scan um, that no other lesions and that um, on the delayed uh, bone scan images, images here on the right, that it does really accumulate um, in the proximal tibia. So the treatment for this would be uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, given for um, a variable number of cycles discussed with your pediatric oncologist, followed by restaging of um, both the chest and the um, lesion itself, followed by surgery, and then um, additional months of uh, chemotherapy. Uh, this was the resection of that lesion. Um, initially, you can see you know, the extensor mechanism is taken down. Um, this is the um, popliteal um, neurovascular bundle that was, has been isolated. Uh, and then after this, after the specimen is examined uh, to make sure that the bony margin is good, uh, this incision would be extended um, and a gastroc flap would be used um, to cover this prosthesis as well as um, aid in the reconstruction of the uh, patellar tendon uh, reconstruction. Um, soft tissue sarcoma, there is a multitude of tumor types uh, that can basically come from any um, tissue within the extremities, um, including vessels, the fibrous tissue, lipomatous tissue, uh, muscle, obviously bone, which we just discussed. Um, but the most common type is actually this undifferentiated type, which accounts for around 40% of all uh, soft tissue sarcoma. And that's just these tumors, which have really, when you look at them, they have no um, obvious cell cellular origin and are just very uh, 
undifferentiated tissue, uh, which you can see here, there's no uh, predominant cell type and just looks like a really um, nasty set of cells. Um, so uh, all tissue basically has the capacity for malignant generation, degeneration, and sometimes you do find out what tissue origin you are coming from, and other times it's not important, you just still just treat it like a malignancy. Um, so the general treatment paradigm for these is, um, regardless of its type, is to do some sort of form of radiation, either preoperative or postoperative, and that's often center dependent. Um, then do a wide uh, local excision, trying to achieve uh, limb salvage in most of these cases. Um, and then chemotherapy is dependent on the tumor. Some tumors are um, responsive to chemotherapy, including uh, many of the small round blue cell tumors like soft tissue Ewing's, uh, synovial sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma. However, overall with soft tissue sarcoma, uh, chemotherapy has not been shown in multiple meta-analyses to um, produce a survival benefit. Uh, so this is a, a case of one that was initially treated in outside center. Um, this was called low grade on the biopsy. Um, and so neoadjuvant chemotherapy was started by a local oncologist. And um, this already uh, raises question marks because low grade tumors are not usually so aggressive that they um, envelop um, structures like the femoral artery here. They usually push them to the side um, because of their slow growth. Um, and there was no plan for radiation here. And on follow-up imaging, you can see that the chemotherapy was not effective at all. And this continued to grow. Um, so he was transferred um, where he did um, undergo a resection um, and there was a plan for uh, post-operative radiation since preoperative radiation uh, was deemed um, unlikely to be able to control this and it would continue to enlarge and um, make amputation the only viable option. But um, a limb salvage was performed. Uh, you can see the sciatic nerve here coursing along. Um, uh, the posterior aspect of the tumor and the femoral artery, artery needed to be clamped um, on each side of the specimen and um, vascular surgery then performed um, this temporary bypass um, so that a megaprosthesis uh, could be performed and uh, then they came back into the room to perform this uh, saphenous vein graft um, from the contralateral leg and um, Patient or function of the patient did very well uh, with this prosthesis, but um, unfortunately did um, expire from um, pulmonary disease in a few months, showing that this tumor um, was anything but low grade, highlighting again how important it is to obtain a pathologic diagnosis uh, from the start so that um, you know how to, you know, how aggressively to treat these lesions. Um, so the other main um, topic that must be mentioned in any orthopedic oncology lecture is metastasis because it is uh, probably the most common thing that we treat uh, considering that, you know, there's 3,000 new bone sarcomas a year, but there's 300,000 uh, new breast and prostate uh, cancer diagnoses in the year or every year in the United States. Uh, and, you know, most of these patients um, have been shown to have um, bone metastasis on their postmortem exam. So you can you can just see by the numbers how much more common uh, metastatic bone lesions are versus our sar sarcomatous ones. And they have a much different, different treatment paradigm uh, because you're not uh, necessarily trying to cure any longer uh, since this uh, cancer is already metastasized to the bone. Uh, you're more just trying to restore function, stabilize the bone, uh, provide as much quality of life as possible since some of these people uh, may not have uh, long left to live and really uh, perform individualized care because um, every patient will be in a slightly different situation and there's no one uh, size fits all treatment for them. Um, here's a patient who presented uh, without a known diagnosis, um, having some arm and leg pain uh, that was progressive and leading to this femur fracture. Uh, you can see his proximal humerus has also collapsed into varus. Um, and then on uh, staging imaging, you can see there's these other lesions uh, throughout the pelvis. Um, so the femur was treated um, nearly right away um, after a biopsy since there was a high um, likelihood that this was going to be some sort of metastasis and it was actually determined to be myeloma, uh, which is kind of lumped in with uh, metastasis because they're usually treated very similarly. Um, and for this patient included um, an intramedullary uh, nail. Um, but you can see here, much like unlike the sarcomas, there has been no effort uh, to uh, you know, 
excise this entire lesion. It's just bypassed. And then that lesion will um, undergo radiation treatment as well as he'll start on chemotherapy um, and get some sort of anabolic bone agent. This used to be um, just limited to bisphosphonates, but um, there's now more and more medications available, um, which can be anabolic to the bone, um, including denosumab, as well as intermittent uh, parathyroid hormone or Forteo. Um, so that's kind of the general overview of um, the orthopedic oncology specialty and how you want to approach those um, bone lesions that you see.